great, glad. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for joining us for Cattle Over Coffee. We're glad to have you and our presenter, Dr. Rocky Lemus. Dr. Lemus is from the MSU Department of Plant and Soil Sciences. I'm sure he's a familiar face for many of you. Dr. Lemus's extension and research efforts center around forage establishment, grazing systems and management, hay production, forage fertility, and forage quality. He is the Extension Forage Specialist and leader for the Center of Forage Management and Environmental Stewardship. His areas of expertise include bioenergy crops, carbon sequestration, nutrient management, hay quality and utilization, grazing systems, pasture management, and clover utilization. Dr. Lemus has a vast knowledge of the forages that can be grown in the northern, transition, and southern zones of the U.S. with both cool season and warm season grasses. And if you have small ruminants or large ruminants, we've got you covered today uh, with Dr. Lemus, who, who specializes with both. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lemus. We'll start out with a presentation, and then towards the end, we'll open it up for questions. So please feel free throughout the meeting, jot some, some notes down. If you have some questions, there'll be time at the end. Um, you can post some up in the chat, and we'll be glad to direct Dr. Lemus to your questions. Well, thank you, Levy, for the introduction, and, and welcome, everybody, this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to share you with you some of the uh, uh, some of the things that I think are hot topics these days, especially as we move into the summer uh, and, and we see those changes already on and, and, and hay production and also on, on moisture content and the soil uh, that are going to be impacting what we do this time of the year. So what I want to do is give you a, a quick overview of some of the things that are, that are popping out quite a bit uh, the last several months related to uh, how those uh, practice might impact your forage management uh, production availability. Uh, one thing that I, that I always try to think about when I think about um, grace management is uh, a couple of things that I think we need to keep in mind. And, and one is, uh, what do my animals require? What are the needs of my animals? Uh, depending on what you have, if you have livestock of even cattle or small ruminant or horses or, or dairy, those requirements are going to change. So adoption, adoption of species that are going to meet those requirements is going to be important. The other thing that we need to look at is what you have in your pastures. Does the forage provide it? Do I have to make changes? And sometimes we need to think about those changes to alleviate some of the long-term economic impacts that might have what you're doing. Uh, when I work with producers, I always think about long-term. We need to think about long-term, not just today or tomorrow, but if I'm going to be in the business, how sustainable I can be in the next five to 10 years. Uh, is there enough for four years to do it? Another thing is sometimes we might have uh, a monoculture, and that's okay. But the thing is, do we have different species in those monocultures or in mixes that allows me to actually extend that grazing season and minimize any supplementation that might have an impact on my economic returns? And what do I need to meet to do to meet those deficiencies? And sometimes we need to think about is balancing the system. Uh, you probably hear a lot about regenerative grazing, which is a very popular uh, catchphrase these days. And there is a lot of uh, different school of thought out there. A lot of people uh, trying to uh, provide information on how to do regenerative grazing. Uh, from my point of view, and I think from the science-based approach to regenerative grazing, uh, regenerative grazing has to be related to a balance point. And to do that, we need to start with the basics. That means understanding what species do we have, understanding our soil uh, needs, uh, controlling our weeds, and then be able to balance that system to move that system forward where that system is going to be sustainable and it's going to be productive and have that nutrient cycling and returns that you want to have in your pastures. So it's something that is very important to think about. And the other things I think the most important as at the bottom is does it make, does it make economic sense and does it make common sense? One thing is that we're in the business of making money, right? So we need to think, make sure that some of those practices is going to have an economic return. So, so I think that's one of the major uh, 
pitfalls that we see in, in the South, especially in Mississippi on the cattle business, is that sometimes we do a lot of things, but you don't put the economics ahead of time. What is the return that this system might give me in the long term? And how can I improve it to make it sustainable? So one thing that I want to mention first is I know that this is something that I've gotten a lot in the last couple of months is the passion renovation. Uh, after a drought situation, we know that we went to that drought last fall. Uh, and then we got hit with uh, a very cold weather in the, in the wintertime. So that really have an impact in, in the fields that we have. Most of those were related, losses were related to also poor fertility that make those um, those species more susceptible to those environmental conditions that they were not prepared for. So when I'm thinking about pasture renovation, there's a couple of things that you need to think about, especially coming out of the drought. If you have uh, areas that you lost, you're probably going to see a more aggressive we can, uh, we competition in there because we are opportunistic. They're going to take um, the opportunity to use any space that is available to thrive and compete on your pastures. <clears throat> so that pasture renovation might have to include a weed control program, uh, had to be also based on fertility with proper soil tests and also making sure that you're allowing those grasses that you're trying to establish to actually be established very well before you actually start putting animals in there. So I usually want to think about pasture renovation and thinking about four weeks window of planting and planning. Um, is you planting warm season perennials like Shushat, Bahia grass, and Bermuda grass, ideal planting for those will be May 1st to June 15th. We're almost getting out of that window. Doesn't mean that you can't plant it. The only, mean, the only thing means is that remember that the later you plan, less moisture availability you're going to have, the longer you're going to take, take for them to get established. So you might be deferring that planting and establishment throughout the, the whole season instead of be able to utilize that, those pasture later in the season. And also there's other thing that is very important I think we need to think about is uh, making sure that you have area that is well prepared. Uh, I usually like to see a land that is prepared. I'm gonna prepare my, my seed bed like I'm going ready to plant, but I'm gonna hold off on planting. And when I waited for about two or three weeks, you're going to have that flush of weeds coming because you're turning that ground. You're going to have new seeds coming to, to the top of the ground. They're going to have the opportunity to, to, to germinate. So I'm going to wait that two, three weeks, flush of weeds I'm going to get, and then come back with a glyphosate application to be able to make sure that I'm controlling any competition that's going to put against that new plant I'm going to do. Then I'm going to wait about 10 days after that application of glyphosate, and I'll be able to go ahead and then do my planting. Something that I think is very important, and I've done quite a bit of those this year, is calibrating your drill. I've seen a lot of stand failures last year because the drill was not properly calibrated. Uh, when you're looking at, at a bag of 50 pound of uh, Bahia seed, it's costing you $450. That's a big investment. So you need to make sure that your drill is properly calibrated and you're putting that seed at the proper depth as well to minimize the risk of, of a poor stand. Another thing is, I think it's very important also the fertility part of that new establishment and that's making sure that if you take a soil sample ahead, you can incorporate the lime as you prepare the, lime, the, uh, the, uh, the land. You can apply the recommended phosphorus and have the potassium recommended rate of planting. Uh, I think one of the things that we usually make a mistake is that we want to put that nitrogen out as well. I plant it. Remember that this grass might take from 15 to 20 days to germinate. So by then, probably your, your fertilizer, your nitrogen fertilizer is pretty much gone. And it takes another week for that grass to actually develop a root system that's going to be able to utilize some of the nutrients that were applied. So you're looking about four to five weeks window before you do that. So I usually recommend that you wait until that uh, forage crop had germinated, it's about two or three inches tall, and then let's come back and do that at the application. Another thing is that we have the tendency that as soon as we see that green grass looking good out there, the first thing is we're going to put animals and graze it to the ground. 
Uh, if you've got a new establishment, I recommend that you wait until that grass is at least 10 to 12 inches tall before you start doing your first grazing. And then come back and remove those animals about three to four inches of residual height and let it recover again before you start putting pressure. Remember that those grasses they are dependent on the nutrient reserve that in that a small root system. So the more you graze it heavily, the more nutrients you're moving out of those reserve and the, the higher the chance that you're going to lose that stand very quickly. Another thing that I want to point out is pay attention to your seed and what you're buying. Uh, this is something that I've encountered quite a bit this year, uh, especially with some of the Bahia grass seed that is in the market. Know the purity of the seed. There are a lot of seeds that have been coated out there, about 50%. So that's a new pain for a lot of coating with very little seed. Um, I have still dispute some of the data that are out there that say that uh, because you have the coating, you have a better germination, you have to put a lower, lower seeding rate. I haven't seen that to be the case with some of these perennial warm season grasses. Germination is another thing that's very important. If you see that germination fall be, below 65%, I'm going to question a little bit about the quality of the seed and, and what kind of stand I'm going to get. Uh, another thing that is very important is to know if there are any noxious weeds on the bag, and there's something that I'm going to show you in the, in the next slide. But also calculate uh, the your seeding rate based on pure light seed. Uh, when you point, if I tell you that I'm going to put 20 pounds per acre, I want to make sure that those 20 pounds per acre, every seed is going to germinate. So I'm going to have to adjust for germination and purity, and I might have to put a little, a little bit higher bulk rate of that seed to be able to get to that 20 pounds of actual pureized seed that's going to germinate in that. Uh, just to give an example here, you can see on this, uh, this bahia grass that we have here, that's a uh, USA Mountain, you have the purity, that's a good purity in there, a germination about 67%. You still have hard seed about 13%. That 13% means that there's seed that's going to probably germinate over time. It's not going to germinate all the beginning of the season. Um, there's a lot of also seed being sold out there, what I call uncertified seed. And this is something that you need to be very careful is that sometimes when you buy a certified seed, uh, you might be paying for what you get. Okay? In this case, if I look at pure seed, it says it's 49%, got 50% uh, coating, germination says it's 85%. If I look at the crop seed and wheat seed, it's supposed to be very low. But when we examine the seeds from the producer, you can see that there is a lot of contamination. Uh, you know, some seed that has been sold as uncertified seed might be somebody that harvesting that seed, not cleaning it correctly. And you might be also introducing a species that could be more invasive on your pastures. And this is something that we're seeing with this label here. Uh, this is a bahia grass. It contains a very noxious weed that is very noxious weed in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. We haven't seen a lot of this in Mississippi, and we want to keep it out of Mississippi because there's not a weed control method for this in Bahia grass or Bermuda grass. This grass is called Brunswick grass. Um, it's similar, it's very similar to the seed, it's very comparable to Pensacola Bahia grass, which is sometimes very difficult to tell. And even though this label said that you only have 19 seeds per pound, if you, you put in 20 pounds and you're planting, for example, a producer that will look at this seed, we're planting 40 acres, that's a lot of contamination that you put in your fields, something cannot be controlled later on. So it's very important that you read the labels, understand what you're buying and what you're paying for. Another thing that I've seen a lot of producers asking lately is, well, this new concept of herbicide impregnated fertilizer. Can I use it? Is it something that I, it will be economic on my field instead of having to spray my fields? Can I minimize going to my fields with two passes, one for fertilizer and one for nitrogen or, or, or the fertilizer of herbicide and do it all at once? Well, there are several things that you need to consider when you're doing this. One of the key factors is you need to know what species you're dealing with. What is the growth habit? How tall those, those seeds are, uh, those weeds are? and also the timing and window application, and also selecting the herbicide and ray selection. This herbicide impregnated fertilizer approach is only labeled right now for two chemicals. It's Grayson X HL and DuraCore. 
you can do grace on next HL uh, impregnated herbicide at a rate of two to two pounds per acre, or you can do Duracore at 16 to 20 pound ounces per acre. Uh, this, the data out there suggests for this to be very effective, you need to use at least 200 pounds of fertilizer per acre as a carrier of uniform application. So if you took a soil sample and you levels of phosphorus, potassium, are very good and you don't need a lot of nitrogen to be applied, that's a lot of nitrogen to be applied just to uh, use this method for applying the herbicide. So you need to consider the economics of that as well. This is not something that you can mix at your house either. They have to be properly mixed and have to be done by co-op. So that means that they have to have equipment dedicated used to do that so there is not offsite target of movement of the herbicide with the equipment that they're using into or the crop. So it makes it more difficult to do. Uh, some of the data, uh, some of the species that, just to give an idea of emergence of species in, in Mississippi, this is my estimated timeline of some of these broadly weeds that you might find in pastures uh, in Mississippi. And this is gonna change depending on moisture, soil temperature, grazing pressure, if you're cutting hay or how you fertilize it. But you see here that most of this, uh, except for buttercup and, and hembit, are usually full uh, spring, early winter, Weeds, most of the rest are going to be in the summer. You have thistles, you got ragweed, pigweed, horse nettle, curly, curly duck in there, woolly crotton. So, if I'm trying to target an application with a herbicide impregnated fertilizer, probably I'm going to be looking at this window, which is the same window that we are recommending when you use a broadcast herbicide application. So, so you have to weigh where this will fit on, me, on my system. I see it fitting in areas where you might have a cutover that you can't get in there with a sprayer because it's very rough and, and that spray is gonna be bouncing everywhere. Then using a herbicide impregnated fertilizer might be an option to try to control weeds in those systems. Some of the data that was being col collected was collected by Kevin Bradley, uh, University of Missouri, compare a growth on next application versus the Grayson next impregnated fertilizer and also the same thing with Duracore and try to, co to control different weeds in here. You have a smooth, a smooth pig weed, annual mud shoulder, common lamb spore, and Ladina clover. And this is another thing that sometimes people say, well, I don't want to apply fertilizer because I got clovers. I don't want to lose those clovers. So in that situation might be something that this system might work. But if you look at the comparison for, for pigweed, um, the Duracore was the only one that gave you a little bit of advantage on that uh, using the, the impregnated fertilizer. Uh, when we look at animal shoulder, uh, the Duracore spray or the Grayson HL spray was much better. The same thing for common last water. When it comes to the Atlanta clover, we see where the Duracore um, caused less injury on the Ladino clover compared to the other herbicide treatments that, that he looked at. Another thing that sometimes we don't pay attention if we're doing a renovation is looking at what herbicide have been used in the past. Sometimes uh, making notes of what we spray every year is very important because also have an impact on when deciding when I'll be able to plant something or I'll be able to renovate a passion. And just to give an idea here, this table is in our weed control guidelines. It's just to show you that sometimes depending on what herbicide you're using, you have a window that you have to wait for application uh, to be able to replant those, those, those fields depending on which species you're using. Uh, I think the most forgiving are usually uh, 242 with triclopyr, there's only three weeks. Uh, glyphosate, um, overdrive is one only 30 days. Uh, triclopyr by itself. But if you look at bell pies, you are using bell pie in your pastures to control uh, small grass. And uh, you decided that uh, later on, I want to try to receive that by hair grass or Premier grass pasture. You're looking at two year window before you can do that. There's a herbicide here that is a pre merge called Resolon that you can do full application or spray application. It's not in this list, but also have that uh, 20, uh, uh, that two year, 24 to 48 month window for replanting anything. So it's very important to pay attention to those replanting restrictions before you invest that money into a new seed and, and put it in the in ground that might not be feasible for that. 
I want to switch here really quick and talk about hay production costs and hay production because I think it is another thing that we get in the middle of the summer. And if you look at the chart, about 70% of the cost of hay production is based on your fertilizer. Uh, and I cannot tell you how many people I looked at the fertilizer management practices on hay production and the quality of hay that they're producing, and they're leaving a lot of money on the table. So it's very important to develop a good nutrient management plan based on how many cuts of hay you're going to have, how many applications of nitrogen you have. Uh, I'll see a lot of people say, well, I'm going to apply all my nitrogen at the beginning of the season, but I'm going to cut it three times in the year. Uh, that is a, a very inefficient way to do that. Better to split those applications, but also it's very important that remember, uh, we focus so much on yield that we forget, forget about the nutritive value. And it doesn't matter how much yield you have, if you don't have the nutritive value, what end up is that in December and January, when it's very cold, you're going to stand up more buying more uh, commodities feed to supplement the hay because of the low quality. So actually, you're increasing your feed bill by doing that. So, so soil testing is essential. That's another thing that I cannot emphasize. Any nutrient management plan should be, should be based on your soil test recommendations. And we have a lot of good county agents in every county that can help you with the soil test collection, but also help uh, with the interpretation and what we need to do to make a better plan for you. Based on 17 years that I've been working with Mississippi State, this is my personal observations of what I see when it comes to hay management constraint. More than 80% of you guys do, know, do, do not do soil tests. And if you do, more kudos to you. Uh, but I see a lot of those producers either applying a triple 13, triple 17, instead of developing a, a fertilizer plant that might be more economically and targeted to the needs that they have for the hay production. 60% uh, of the hay field have less than optimum pH for forage production. So when I'm talking, talking about optimum, I'm talking about six. Um, also, the, you guys might be in the 5.5 five to 5.7 five range in what I've seen in the past. But also, we see that it's about 80% of the hay fields and pastures in Mississippi has a potassium deficiency. That's when we see that a lot of the losses in our fields because potassium is like the, uh, the immune system of the plant. It protects that plant from drought stress, cold stress, but also insects and damages. So when the potassium is not there and we get a situation like we saw last, last fall with the drought and in that cold weather, then is when we start to see those fields start to, to suffer more because of the potassium deficiency. Another thing that is when it comes to pH, I think it, you need to be aware that, you know, most of these nutrients that are potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, are going to be available to the plant in a range of about six to seven pH, depending on, on what soil type you have. But every time that we put nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium out there, without having a, an adjustment for pH, we actually re decreasing that efficiency. And the problem is that every time that we have a low pH, we increase the amount of aluminum and iron that in the soil, in solution, and those two are very, toxic to the root system. So the, the higher those level, the, the shorter the root systems are gonna be in a drought situation, they cannot extrapolate water from deeper horizons. And then when we start losing those, those fields. But it, it has an impact also on the efficiency of how the root system can take up those nutrients. And if we go out here from the extreme pH from four, five to seven, what we see, I want you to see is on the right side, you have the red numbers. That is the amount of fertilizer wasted. So if you are in a pH of four or five and you put 100 pounds of fertilizer, for example, that means that you're losing about 71 pounds of that fertilizer that the plant can utilize. At a pH of five five, we're still losing about 32% of that. And at, once you get to about a medium acid pH of six, you will lose at 20%. And that's going to be normal. That we, that's acceptable because we have volatilization of the nitrogen, leaching of the potassium. Those will, depending on the soil type, that we can live with that. But one thing below that, you start to lose money. I want you to pay attention to those red numbers because I'm going to use those in the next slide to show you what is the economic impact that this will have in your, in your operations. So let's assume 
that you got Bermuda grass and you're going to cut it three times this year, okay? I'm going to use 150 units of nitrogen and split applications. We That's our recommendation for hay production. If you are making hay, 50 units of nitrogen per cut of hay should be enough. If you apply more than that, that plant cannot utilize that very well. The other thing is I'm putting 50 units of phosphorus. I'm going to apply that at the beginning of the season. Phosphorus doesn't move on the soil, so you're not going to lose that throughout the season as you do with nitrogen and potash. And I'm going to use potash, and it's calling for 90 units of potash. I'm going to split that also, 30 units per cut of hay. We've seen that the application of nitrogen and potash uh, together have a better response to yields and then just applying all the potash at the beginning of the season. But also remember these grasses, they're a luxury consumer. What that means is that if, if you put all the potash at the beginning of the season, they're gonna take it up and then you're gonna end up with a lot of deficiency later on on the, on the current season. I'm gonna use, I'm assuming I'm gonna use a money nitrate. I'm gonna use triple phosphate and potash for my fertilizers. So I'm using, for this recommendation, I, I'm actually using prices that I got from the co-op to do that table. When I talk to producers, they tell me that um, uh, they cannot, they don't want lime is because lime is very expensive, okay? And it could be, depending on your situation. Say if you have a, in this case, a pH of four or five, and I'm following the same pH that I have in the previous table, uh, it's going to require about three, time, three tons of effect of lime, okay? Effect of lime means that 100% of the lime is going to, the application is going to fertilize, it's going to neutralize my, my acidity. Well, in real, in real life, there is no lime that's 100% effective. Lime, depending on the material and where it's common, can range from 65 to 75% relative neutralizing value. So that means that if we if it calls for three tons of effective lime on the salt test, and my lime is 65, 67% affecting a neutralizing value, I'm gonna have to apply four and a half tons of that lime to get that. And that's why we see that producers that call me sometimes and say, you know, I put the lime out that Mississippi State recommended. And sometimes what they've done is because they didn't look at the neutralizing value, they might be only pulling about half of the amount of lime and not seeing that rapid change in pH. So if I go to, I'm gonna use a 5.5 five here, which is more typical of Mississippi. I'm gonna to need to apply two tons of effective lime. So that means that I need three tons of the bulk lime. It's gonna cost me about $164 per acre, okay? Let's, let's look at that value. Now, I'm gonna take that 5 pH, 5.5 five pH, and gonna apply this nitrogen here. And you saw the losses of the fertilizer on the previous slide. So if I do my applications of 50 units of nitrogen and the phosphorus and potash for the season, I'm losing, at that pH, I'm losing $72 per acre, okay? Because my fertilizer efficiency went down. Now, let's look at what happened to my yields. If I have... If I, the, the, the closer to that pH of six, the best opportunity you have to increase that efficiency and to increase your yields. I'm not looking at the nutrient value here, but I'm assuming that this will be in a 30 to 35 day cutting system, okay? So if my pH is four or five, my expected yield will be about two tons per acre. Out of five, about three, five, five, about four, one year to about six, should be about six tons per acre. So if I put a value at that five, five, that means that I'm losing two tons if I put the line to get it to a pH of six. So my net, uh, my difference from the maximum of that $1,000, I'm losing $391, okay? So if I'm losing $391 in there, and my line it cost me $164, it shows you that the economic opportunity to put the lime out is very, very highly effective. So that really raised that lime is the cheapest fertilizer out there. If you had to do one thing in your farm and the first thing that you have to do is lime, I will encourage you to go ahead and bring that pH where you need to be at before you do any fertilizer application to minimize the losses of efficiency in that fertilizer bill. So that will be my fair approach in that type of system. 
So another thing that I want to point out is and this is becoming very popular. If you are in, in social media, especially Facebook, you're probably going to see this quite a bit. Um, like liquid lime. This is something that we see happening uh, a lot uh, being pushed into social media. These products that call that they control your root sedge, they control your wheat. Remember, like liquid lime is not a fertilizer. This is a calcium-based product. For pH to be neutralized in the soil, you need calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate is what's going to attach to the hydrogen floating in the soil to be able to neutralize that acidity. Now, a lot of these products are not labeled for really give you an effective uh, long-term uh, pH control in your fields. You might see your fields turning green because calcium turns plants very dark green, but might not have a lot of growth coming out of that system. And I like to point at this, this is a great data that was collected at, by my a colleague at University of Kentucky, uh, Chris Deutsch, looking at what happened at the application of liquid calcium at five gallons per acre versus compared to control or using pelletized lime or acline. The pelletized lime and the acline was applied at two tons per acre and the liquid calcium at five tons per acre. And what you see here, they started with a pH that was 5.2, very low pH. And the application, they measured that pH in the soil at one month, three months, six months, and 12 months after the application. And what they see here is that the acclime or the pelletized lime really reached that target pH by between one and three months. You don't see that happening with the liquid lime. Didn't change much from the control, okay? Uh, even though they incorporate pelletized lime in this system, I know it's not a product that I would recommend because it's very expensive uh, to justify the economic application and, and pastures and hay fields. I think act lime will be sufficient to actually achieve those, those methods that we recommend. So one of the advantages that you have with liquid lime, remember you're dealing with a product in a jug. High operational cost, you're hauling water and lime across the pasture or hay field. Having to apply more than often than dry lime, sources due to quick reactivity. You might see in some of these products a quick spike and you go two months, three months later, probably it's already back where it need to be at. Under liming, you, you had to be able to put a lot of this product to do that. And remember that calcium is a positive ion. You need the carbonate to reduce the display of how the activity. So, so just to give an idea, I want to look at the two numbers at the bottom instead of giving to the whole calculation. But if I wanted to achieve two tons per acre application based on a salt test recommendation, a liquid lime versus using um, ac lime, with the acclime at a $55 per ton, I need three and a half tons per acre. That's costing me about $170 per acre. To achieve the same thing, I will have to use 57 cases of five gallon uh, jugs of that. Uh, $50 a jug, that is two to almost $2,800 per acre. So there's no brainer when it comes to uh, the uh, need to make sure that you're using the proper management practices that can benefit the economic input of your farm. Another thing that we see quite a bit is uh, the push for this liquid fertilizers. Remember that we're dealing with uh, special Bermuda grass and Bahia grass, they are tropical grasses that have been adapted to our semi-tropical environment in Mississippi and across the South. They have a, a, a very waxy, leafy material that will not allow the penetration of this liquid fertilizer like you see with horticultural crops. So this is a study that we did for two years on Bahia grass, Tifton non Bahia grass, looking at what is the effective, the effective way of these fertilizers on hay production. And this was applied at uh, three, we have three cuts of hay in 2000, 2022 and two, three cuts of hay last year. And we have a control, we didn't put anything, or we use the uh, Agritech Plus 
uh, product, we use the Apache Booster Plus, or we use the product protocol, uh, protocol Roger Growth. And we apply at the recommended rate. The recommended rate is one gallon per acre. So we did one gallon per acre per cut of hay. So there were three gallons of this product applied each year. Or we went back and used our recommended application of 50 units of nitrogen per acre per cut of hay. And we used urea or urea ammonium sulfate blend. And then we took this liquid fertilizer and adjusted to the recommended 50 units of nitrogen that we recommend. Remember that if you look at, for example, uh, this Roger Grove product at the bottom, it says that it's a Teddy zero zero, okay? For sake of this presentation, that gallon, that that weight of that one gallon will be about 10, 10, 10 pounds. So if I multiply uh, point, uh, point 0.3 times 10, that means I only put about three pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's not a lot of nitrogen to make those grasses grow to a level that you need for production. So what we see here is that the control in the application of one gallon pretty much stays very similar to the control. We see an improvement with a 50 gallon application, but the yields were not a little bit higher when it comes, not significant from the uh, urea, but not higher than the urea monosulfate. So when we look at the uh, economic cost, and this is per pound of dry matter produced, if I use this, those rates and look at the economic value, to produce one pound of dry matter, those liquid fertilizer cost me about 91 cents, 17 cents with the Roger Grow. I lost money with the uh, Pasture Booster Plus. Uh, my granular fertilizer per pan of dry matter cost me less than a penny or 10 cents with the urea minor sulfate. When I adjust those to really get to those rates, we see that I jumped about $8 uh, uh, per ton of dry matter produced with the Agritech Plus. So they don't give you a lot of economic advantages when it comes to the production of hay production in the South. Uh, we're also looking at the utilization of grazing management. And, and this is something that sometimes can apply when we have that transition from ryegrass, what can I have into my summer pastures? And there's a lot of producers now that want to try to maintain or retain some calf in the summer, try to put some weight so they can go into ryegrass in the, the following fall. So we're looking at these clean point grazing systems. And what we're looking mainly is at crabgrass. I like crabgrass because it does very well for us in Mississippi. If you have crabgrass and you plant it one year and you let it recede at least once, they will do very well in our climate. So we did a comparison here for two years, uh, looking at what happened uh, having those calf grazing by hair grass of grazing prime 380 per millet, or comparing to three crabgrasses, Moyo, Quick and Big Spreader, or Red River. And what we see is that in that system for reconditioning some of those animals going into ryegrass later in the fall or into early winter, we see that those calves have a gain, or well, at least um, 93 pounds with the uh, per millet, and with the Red River, we, go, we gain about 122 pounds. So there's a possibility to use this as a pinpoint grazing system to improve the nutrition and nutrition value and an opportunity to gain more in the summer with, with this system. Uh, another thing that we're working on right now, we have some preliminary data. I've been looking at uh, the use of brachiarias. Brachiarias are tropical grasses, mainly in Central and South America, and Brazil is one of the major staple uh, grassing systems. And we have been looking at introducing them with our summer annuals or as themselves into, into Mississippi. And the reason for that is because these brachiarias take about 30 days to, to germinate, but they stay until uh, productive until the frost come in. We're probably in South Mississippi, we might be able to make it more perennial than an annual system, but they produce a lot of biomass. Little fertility, we gaining about 12 uh, 20%, 12 crude protein, which is very hard to uh, achieve with very little fertility in our systems. But I think uh, there's an opportunity for soil health. If you look at uh, that picture on the right, 
we have a massive root system as well that can have a lot of soil health benefits by biomass production, carbon sequestration, carbon credit down the road, down the road into our grazing system. So there's a lot of systems that we're looking at. We are expanding across Mississippi and hopefully be able to test in some farms and see the opportunity to see how they can be integrated to, to extend the grazing season. Uh, that's all I have. Um, I'd like to open the opportunity for any question that you have. Uh, later on, if also if you have any other questions, here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out or reach your can extension office and we'll be able to work with you and see how we can uh, help you in any possible way to improve the, uh, the sustainability of your grazing system hay production. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, Dr. Lee, can I have a question about the liquid fertilizer? I, I can well, highly hear you. One of the reasons why people are attracted to using the liquid fertilizer, why am I, oh, let's see if I can put it in the chat. It sounded like the question was about liquid fertilizers. Is that right? Oh, why people are interested in liquid fertilizer? Well, I think it's a, there, there, there is, it's, it's, be, it's becoming appealing because they think that it's something that is in a jug. I can only have to put a gallon of this and they, in the long term, they think it's cheaper than, than using uh, granular fertilizer. But when we look at the economics and actually the benefit of it, it's not there. Uh, I know they, I wish people would look more at the data based on science more than the testimonials that are on online. There's a lot of testimonials that I see a lot of these companies promoting, but two fields from the distance and you can't really tell much, but they're buying into these systems. And, and a lot of the, uh, what I call uh, regenerative grazing gurus get, get paid to give a lot of talks without any research data are promoting this and they're following those people. So, uh, you know, to me, based on the data that we have and what my colleagues and other universities have seen, I don't think it's a sustainable system. You need to start with a soil sample. Let's work from there and build a program that is gonna be sustainable for, for the long term and minimize. If you're one of those that that think that fertilizer is bad, that that uh, herbicide are bad, let's 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 take an approach to use those to set the basis and then win off from the utilization of those systems but you cannot start from the opposite you cannot go and try to fix your pastures or soils with this liquid fertilizer without knowing what you need first i hope that answers your question Thanks, Rocky. Um, I kind of want to expand a little bit on a comment that you made there, and then I thought you had some really good slides talking about the importance of soil testing. Um, I think producers all know that that's something that's really important, um, and I think you made some references on your slides in regards to hay ground. Uh, what's the general recommendation for producers for pulling soil samples on pasture, say grazing ground versus hay ground, how often or how frequently do they need to plan to do that? Okay, you know, you know we're, we're, it depends, you know, when we look at a, when I, when we look at a hay field, for example, uh, and I'm going to make the contrast between the two, and a hay field, even though Mississippi State is giving you a three-year soil test recombination, I like to see that to be tested every year if, if the, if the uh, nutrient levels are bad. If the nutrient level, levels are in the medium, level, medium side, we can test every other year. And the reason for that is, remember, you're removing a lot of nutrients with hay production. And those nutrients either go into other parts of your farm where you're feeding the hay, or you might be selling the hay and exporting those nutrients completely out of your farm. So you have to look at replenishing those nutrients to make sure that the plants are going to be productive. In a pasture situation, it's a little bit different. 
We're looking at lower recommendations for for comparing to your hay production. I'm probably gonna lower my nitrogen recommendations on that. Uh, my potassium recommendation is gonna be a little bit lower. And the reason for that is because sometimes if you adjust the pH, you might be able to also to incorporate legumes in that system. And by incorporating legumes, you're minimizing the need for high nitrogen applications. I'm probably gonna put a low nitrogen application used to get those grass is active and competing with my legumes and maintain the system. So we might be looking at a soil sample that is taken every three years versus every year or every other year with a hay production system. Uh, and in the grazing situation, I like to see a recommendation, uh, I mean, I like to see a, a fertilizer recommendation be put at the beginning of that grass has started to green up and then come back in midsummer after a good after a good moisture level uh, sometime late june july if i need to and put a little bit of extra nitrogen and that should be enough to carry your forage production and pasture system throughout the whole season when i'm talking about bahia grass and vermeer grass that doesn't mean that it's going to be that nitrogen is going to be there for ryegrass uh, that's another thing that you need to think about uh, I think another thing that you need to think about, and since we're talking about this, is also the incorporation of portal litter. Uh, I think a portal litter is a great product if you are in need of phosphorus and potassium. If your phosphorus and potassium are very low and you need to boost those and you have the option to obtain some portal litter, it's fantastic. You're looking at about 90% of that potassium and the phosphorus being available to the plant. If you're looking at a nitrogen substitute, might not be so much. Why? Because only about 30% of that nitrogen might be available the first year. Remember, you're dealing with an organic product. That means that you're gonna have to have a good microbial activity and you might have to have a good moisture level for those that organic matter being decomposed and releasing those nutrients. That is gonna happen mainly in the summer. I see a lot of producers trying to use port litter to supplement ryegrass in the wintertime. Uh, cold weather, soil temperature decrease, you don't have a lot of microbial activity, you might not get in the best benefit out of that portal litter. Thanks, Rocky. I think there's been some really good comments uh, about several different topics during your talk. Um, I know we didn't have a whole lot that tuned in live, but I know we've had a bunch that signed up that will get the recording that we'll share with them, everybody who registered for the course. Any last questions from anyone before we sign off? If there are no more questions, I wanna thank you, Rocky, for spending uh, your lunchtime-ish hour with us um, and invite y'all all back to join us on July 9th. Uh, we'll start at the same time at 11 o'clock. We'll cover beef cattle health uh, with Dr. Isaac Jumper from the College of Veterinary Medicine. So Thank that, you. We will sign. We will sign off. Thanks, everyone.